Okay, think of big cities in Texas, or even the United States, and this one will definitely come to mind. The Big H, Houston. But in truth, this mega city is made up of dozens of smaller cities. And today we head to one out of this world. Kima! This episode was made for y'all with the help of our awesome partners. Check the caption for more info. Kima sits just 30 miles from the heart of Houston and is actually part of Bay Area Houston, consisting of other cities like LaPorte, League City, Nassau Bay, Seabrook, and Webster. But to begin our day trip journey, we must leave Earth behind. kind of need those guys. So we aren't going to space today, but we are headed to Space Center Houston, the official visitor center of NASA's Johnson Space Center. Wow. And an incredible glimpse into what it's actually like and what it takes to leave Earth behind. Now that would be a day trip. Oh, cool. It's the shuttle flight deck. The cockpit. Beep, boop, beep, boop, beep. Can you imagine knowing what every one of these buttons does? Engage laser beams. <laughs> Oh yeah, sure, you know, your your keel camper power isn't on. So, you know, just flip that switch, it's real easy. You have to engage your A outlet, but make sure your reading is OP. Man, this is all over my head. And that's exactly why the real rocket scientists do this, and not me. But even if you're just a lowly day tripper, the Space Center lets you get pretty close to the fun and experience what it's like on the International Space Station. This is a typical crew stowage rack. It's like the astronaut's closet in space, and this one is yours. Oh, Chip, those are cute. Your favorite pair of choo-choo train underwear goes floating all down the module. There. I know. Oh, hey, let's talk about sleeping in space. Yeah. They can go to sleep in space just hanging in the air, but then they float around and they bump into stuff. <laughs> so they have these sleep restraint units. The exercise is extremely important. Wow. They work out for two and a half hours every day on the station. The waste hygiene compartment, but the astronauts call it the space potty. <laughs> That's a hose and a funnel in the front of the space potty. What do you do with that, Chet? Uh, you know, I'm not, probably not cook with it. Astronauts live on the ISS for months at a time, so these tight quarters have to have everything they need, including food. I'm not so sure I could leave barbecue behind for that long. It's so weird to think that in space, there's no floor, there's no ceiling, there are no side walls. It's just one big room and you can float to whatever you want. The center is full of spacey goodness, but sadly, no anti-gravity room. I checked. But beyond the mock-up vessels and the space games, this place has a number of incredible historic objects from the various NASA missions, which all tell the story of how us humans got the crazy idea to go to space. I believe, I believe that this nation, nation should, should commit itself, itself to achieving the goal before this before decade this is out, out of landing, landing a man, a man on, the on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept and one we intend to win, and the others do. 
So after Kennedy laid the end goal of going to the moon, NASA was put to task to figure out how to do it. And with that mission came the Mercury 7. Seven military pilots chosen as essentially human guinea pigs for the great space experiment. Mercury gave way to Gemini, where at least you had a partner, and where they accomplished the very first spacewalk. And with the knowledge from Mercury and Gemini came Apollo, and finally putting a man on the moon, which required a firepower so enormous that it gets its own building. Oh my goodness. Look at this thing. Wow. That's a Saturn V rocket. That's how they got men to the moon. But when you lay it down, I mean, you really tell how long this thing is. It's over a football field long, like 360 something feet. Man, TV just doesn't do this thing justice, I promise. And with this rocket came the Apollo missions. From the tragedy that occurred at Apollo 1 to finally walking on the moon at Apollo 11. Apollo 13, which proved NASA's amazing engineering skills. And with each Saturn rocket, three astronauts went up. But there were still thousands on the ground, making sure things went as planned, all from the base of historic mission control. And when the astronauts famously said, uh, Houston, we have a problem, they were speaking to the men in this room. There's more technology in my phone than there was in this entire building when they sent a man to the moon. Can you believe that? That's like mind blowing. While we may no longer have our sights set on the moon, there's still much research to be done in space, which is still happening aboard the International Space Station, overseen on the ground here in modern day mission control. Tours also take visitors to the training facility where astronauts get ready for the ISS and someday the future Orion missions. Pretty incredible stuff. But not all astronauts are stuck behind glass. And today we get to meet one. This is Dr. John David Bartow. He flew on the Challenger shuttle in 1985 and returned to Earth with some incredible stories. We're in zero G, we're floating free, and I guarantee you kids, you would just absolutely love this. You can't imagine the emotion that you feel the first time that you look down on the Earth. I just saw this one continuous planet uh, and land masses just con continuing everywhere. It turns out each country is not painted a different color, like on the maps. <laughs> really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. Now, do you think there's important work still left to do in space? Absolutely. The, and the, the key right now, in my opinion, is this research that we're doing on the space station. We're coming across all kinds of interesting things that are brought on by this zero-G environment. It's, it's, it's just unbelievable. Wow. Going to space would be amazing. But I suppose it's a little late for me to catch the shuttle on that one. Chet Garner, please report to launch pad. Chet Garner, please report to launch pad. Maybe it's not too late. Garner, this is Capcom Garner down in Mission Control, and we prepare for liftoff today. Uh, Roger Houston, commencing pre-flight check. Excellent. All right, well, we'll initiate the countdown as soon as you're strapped in. OK, I'm entering the command module. We are go for launch. Initiating engines, and T minus five, four, three, two, one and a half, one and a quarter, one and an eight. No, I'm just kidding. One zero. Go to space. Okay, Garner. It looks like your telemetry looks good, your symmetry looks good, your asymmetry looks good, and your telepathy looks good as well. So uh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead and initiate orbit. Beep boop boop beep boop boop. Garner, you are go for lunar excursion. This is awesome! You know, I didn't expect to make it to the moon today, but I'm noticing a complete lack of restaurants for lunch. Better rock it back down to Kima, because I've got one rocket-shaped delicacy that I'm hungry for. Now commencing flight to the Hoagie Ranch. We now interrupt this programming to remind you to like and subscribe. Now back to the road. 
The Hoagie Ranch is one of those one-of-a-kind joints that only the locals know about, and those willing to stray off the beaten tourist path. And by locals, of course I mean astronauts, taking down one of the tastiest sandwiches our fair planet has to offer. All right, and this is Jim Bevan, the owner of Hoagie Ranch. Hey, thanks for having us here. Hey, good to have you. So tell me about this place. Well, we've been here about 20 years, and uh, we serve a lot of locals. We sell uh, a lot of different kinds of foods, seafood, burgers, uh, a lot of deli meats. So uh -huh. we cut our own corned beef, uh, roast beef, and uh, slice everything fresh here. Oh, very Make cool. Make our own breads. Have you been a sandwich connoisseur your whole life? Or? Absolutely. Yes, I've been doing this for about 40 years. Oh, impressive. So, uh, impressive. Yeah, so what do you think of uh, Hoagie Ranch? I eat here three to five times a week. No way! <laughs> three to five times a week? It's great food, good company, and it's one of our hidden jewels that we have in Kima. Yeah, would you call this place a hole in the wall? Uh, it's a, an eclectic little place uh, with... Uh, <laughs> All, ki yeah, yes, uh, all kinds of little things on the walls and uh, uh, something to hold everybody's interest. Sure, of course. From astronauts to buffaloes. <laughs> <laughs> right. So where did you get, uh, how do I put this delicately, all your treasures on the wall? See, I, I didn't call it junk. All this junk? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I've been uh, picking for a long time. It used to drive my family crazy. And I'd stop any time I saw a pile of junk. And the kids would go, no, not again. <laughs> <laughs> I see your wall over here with a lot of autographs and stuff. You get a astronauts, big fans of the Hoagie. Oh, yeah, yeah. Is this whole place kind of space crazy? I think so, yeah. Very cool. Well, hey, Jim, thank yeah. you much. All right. However, it's not as easy as just eating a sandwich. There's so many choices. I think I'll just have to use one of life's golden rules. What would Sam Houston do? He'd eat an 18-inch Sam Houston Hoagie is what he would do. And General Sam always knows best. Somebody, actually I know it was Jim, convinced me to order an 18 inch hoagie. This is ridiculous. This is the Sam Houston. I got half of it cold and half of it hot. It's got salami, ham, provolone cheese, American cheese, just the way General Sam used to like it. So they throw the whole dang sandwich right there on top of the grill so the bread gets steamy and all the meat sort of gets crispy around the edges. Look how gooey and delicious that is. All right, I don't want to leave the cold sandwich out. You can't even close this guy. Oh, that's good. It's the same sandwich. It tastes totally different hot and cold. I mean, it all just goes together to make this one incredible sandwich. Now that we're back from space and well fed, it's time to explore a bit. Bay Area Houston is surrounded by water. Not only Galveston Bay, but also Clear Lake which explains why the Bay Area has the third largest collection of pleasure crafts in the United States. It also has the largest and coolest collection of pelicans. While this area is well-developed with NASA and tourism today, that wasn't always the case. Before this part of Texas started sending men to the moon, it was like many other parts of Texas. That is, just pasture land. But some of the cows grazing in these fields weren't exactly your average breeds. To learn more, I'm headed to the Butler Longhorn Museum, a tribute to one of my favorite things, Texas Longhorns. And this is museum director Monica Hughes. Well, the museum was really created to preserve the history of League City and five founding families, including the Butlers, of raising the cattle, purebred cattle. If it was not for the Butlers and five founding families, we would not have Texas Longhorns. <laughs> now there is a lot of people in one university who are very thankful for that. Exactly. Yes, the Butler family is to thank for keeping the Texas Longhorns around, as years of careless cow breeding almost caused the Longhorn to drift into cow muttdom. Is there any one particular trait that makes a Texas Longhorn a Texas Longhorn? A lot of people will look at a horn, if it's shaped a certain way, oh, that's a Texas Longhorn, but it goes deeper than that. Okay, it's about DNA here. So was all this just pasture land back in the day? All of this was pasture land. Mr. Butler owned 55,000 acres, went from Galveston all the way up past Princewood. The area here in League City was the main breeding program. And hence the location of the museum, which remains the best place to learn about the Butler family and the painstaking efforts they took to keep the Longhorn pure, a breed which had originally come over from Spain, but took on a persona as Texas as the Alamo. In fact, there was even a Butler Longhorn in the Alamo movie, Miss John Wayne. And despite John Wayne's offer to buy, Mr. Butler refused to sell. You see, many of these Longhorns were like family pets. There's classic, Mojo, Dixie Sam, Red Rose, 
and many other family members well preserved for future generations. But it's time to see some of the Bay Area's other animals, perhaps living animals. And one spot to see that up close and personal is the Armand Bayou Nature Center. At 2,500 acres, Armand Bayou is one of the largest urban wilderness areas in the United States and offers visitors the chance to interact with the animals that call it home. The Texas rat snake. Man, this guy's long. Among the animals that inhabit Armand Bayou are park director Tom Cartrude and his sidekick Lucy the rat snake. But it's by no means just animals in cages. Armand Bayou has plenty existing in the wild. So we're gonna take a tour with resident naturist Mark Kramer. Wow, this is beautiful out here. Mark, this is pretty impressive. And to think we're like right in the shadow of Houston. Yeah, you know, Houston is known as the Bayou City and there is probably no finer example of a bayou than what you see right around us right here. We have made a lot of progress in cooperation from local industry and federal regulations and guidelines that have improved water quality. Things have gotten a lot better. Wetlands are now being restored. So when you put all those cumulative effects of all those different things together, it really has made a difference. And you know, there are things living here today that definitely weren't here when I was in my youth. Wow. The Nature Center and its volunteers have done an incredible job restoring the vibrant habitat that is Armand Bayou. And evidence of their success is all around us. We see some of the benefits off to the left here. Out of a beautiful great blue heron right at the wetland edge. Yeah, and there's a big powerful bird of prey perched in the top of this dead tree, an osprey. He's going to talk to you a little bit. Those are birds that greatly benefit from the enhanced water quality and the aquatic life that oh, lives in these kinds of wetlands. That's cool. Today, the bayou is teeming with life, fish and birds of every kind. There's really probably no place along the coast of Texas where you'll go to find more richness of life than you see right around you here. It's the coming together of the bayou, the forest, and the grasslands back behind the trees that account for this great diversity. Oh wow, look, that's a least bitter and flying over there into that California bulrush marsh. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's a really unusual bird, not commonly seen around Texas, but they depend on that kind of bulrush marsh in order to live. And they're particularly adapted with special feet that allow them to walk stem to stem. They don't actually wade in the water like most other herons and egrets do. That's really cool. So for a birder, this is a pretty big deal right here. Yeah, that's right. It's not easy to see a least bitter, and bird watchers will travel a pretty good distance to see one. Wow, this turned out to be a fantastic day for bird watching. But in every proper bayou, of course, there's one other thing you need to look out for, and that's alligators. Uh, the Nature Center has really been expanding our research efforts for the Armand Bayou alligator population. Been going out at night, conducting spotlight counts. And this stretch about 30 yards ahead of us here is about two weeks ago where we saw an adult alligator with a full-size white-tailed deer in its mouth. So they are the apex predator on the refuge. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so I think I'll find my swimming holes elsewhere. And although we keep a watchful eye, it's just not a good day for gators. But Armand Bayou is an incredible spot to just sit back and enjoy all of God's beautiful bayou creations, from the safety of your own boat, of course. With Galveston Bay and all the surrounding water full of life, you can imagine what's for dinner. Yep, seafood, fresh by the boatload. And one of my favorite spots that's a bit off the beaten path is in nearby San Leon. Welcome to Bubba's Shrimp Palace. That's Bubba's big pink shrimp palace. If a restaurant called Bubba's is secure enough to paint itself pink, chances are Bubba can cook. And if Bubba's gonna build a palace out of shrimp, chances are Bubba makes some mighty fine shrimp. All right, so this is Rafael Lozano, the manager out here. So this food looks awesome. Now how does, how does one build a palace out of shrimp? Basically, you do all you can eat shrimp. That's what we're known for. Uh -huh. People come for hours, three hours, four hours, even I've heard five hours drive just to come eat all-you-can-eat shrimp. You must have seen some of these big boys polish off a lot of shrimp. All the big boys kill it, but honestly, the guy about this tall polished yeah. off, and they said it was about this big around, about 130-something shrimp. No way! Yeah. <laughs> and we don't use those little bitty popcorn shrimp. We use yeah. the big shrimp come straight out of the Galveston Bay. We try to do everything as much local as possible. That's fantastic, man. I mean, you're being so close to the bay, there's no excuse not to have fresh no, no, no. seafood. But you don't have to go for shrimp gold, as the kitchen has a full spread. All right, so you come to Shrimp Palace, but you're not having shrimp. Oh, no, I like the oysters here. 
Really? Yes, they great. So you come to Bubba's often? Yes, I used to come here around about uh, two or three times a week. Oh. I like the scenery here. I mean, it's the water. You can, uh, you know, just enjoy here. It's our four month uh, anniversary, so. Excited to come to Bubba's. <laughs> yeah, Bubba's! <laughs> bringing people together. Bringing, you know, this is where people fall in love and stay in love over <laughs> shrimp platters. Okay, so I see you had the shrimp. Yes, I did. What do you think? It's great. Yeah? Very good. So did you do the all-you-can-eat shrimp? No. <laughs> no. I did the eight, and I can only eat four. So. <laughs> well, I think I can probably do better than four. So let's get to it. Here we go. It's plate number one of the all-you-can-eat shrimp feast. I got green beans, loaded baked potato, and then I'm starting with 11 shrimp. It's time to dig in. Look at that, baby. That's huge. That ain't no popcorn shrimp, my friend. That is a jumbo Galveston Bay shrimp right there. Oh, hot. That puppy came right out of the fryer. Man, there's just something about fresh shrimp. I mean, I don't care how you cook it. You fry it, you put it in gumbo, you know, you boil it, you can tell the difference when a shrimp is fresh. And that is a fresh shrimp. Homemade Jimmy Walker sauce. That is delicious. It's sort of like a rumelade, kind of a, a spicy dressing. I think I could eat 30, 40, 50 shrimp if it's dipped in this sauce. Normally I would tell you that if you're eating an all-you-can-eat shrimp meal, that you shouldn't waste your time on the baked potato or the green beans. But I'm gonna break my own rule. I mean, it is just awesome sitting out here right on Galveston Bay, knowing that your dinner was caught literally right out there. Sun setting in the background, and I'm polishing off a fried shrimp platter. Now, if that's not the Southeast Texas way to live, I don't know what is. As good as this is, I've still got to save room for our last stop. So the East Coast has Coney Island, and the West Coast, they got Santa Monica Pier. But here on the Third Coast, we got our own. It's called the Kima Boardwalk. Kima used to be a small, unassuming little town on the water, but now it's the bay's beaming beacon of amusement. You want to kill an afternoon or evening, and quite possibly your wallet having a good time, Kima is the place to go. Live music, flash pad, plenty of tasty food. You guys got some funnel cake, you wanna try? Come on, man! And of course, plenty of rides for various levels of bravery. You know, I never knew I was capable of screaming like a girl. Now this is the way to finish up a day trip. Call this trip out of this world would be an understatement. And whether you explore by air, land, or sea, Bay Area Houston is one of the best day trips on Earth and beyond. Well, we have gone to the moon and back. Well, actually, Bay Area, Houston, and back. But man, it's been a good day. So I'll see all y'all out on the road. Bye, con Dios, amigos. Yeah, let's go, Bunny, come on, get it. Welcome to Bubba's, <laughs> welcome. I just heard you do it. I was like, we're trying to do a Richie impersonation. Ready? Where's PBS on this thing? Maybe some Nova or, hey, Day Tripper. We got any of that? So what sort of hoagie should I get? Oh, Wooly Mammoth hoagie. Is that off menu? Oh, with the saber tooth sauce. Okay. Everybody go home. Kiss your babies, kiss your wives. Well done. I'm gonna go to the food court, have a burrito. All right, I'm doing okay. But this is TV. I gotta make it look like I ate a lot of shrimp. I'm gonna need more shrimp. I'm gonna need more shrimp. Can I have some more? Oh, Hi, wow, you. thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, here we go. 13, 14. 15, 
16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. What is the blue? Howdy, y'all. Follow along with my adventures at Chet Tripper on Instagram and at the Day Tripper TV on Facebook and YouTube. Or head to thedaytripper.com for travel guides, past episodes, and info on our mobile app and Team Day Tripper. This episode was made for y'all with the help of our awesome partners. Check the caption for more info. Howdy, y'all. Chet the Day Tripper here. Thanks so much for tripping with us. Uh, remember, while you're here, like this video, subscribe to our channel so that we can stay out there on the road and keep on tripping. Did we miss anything in this town? Leave us a comment, let us know. We love finding out about new stops with all your tips. And if you love Epic Texas Day Trips, remember to check our channel. We got a lot of them on there. Also, don't forget, if you want some sweet Day Tripper merch or another cool Texas made product, Come see us in Georgetown at the Day Tripper World Headquarters. You can also shop online if you check the link down there in the caption. All right, y'all. Bye, Condios, amigas.